Last year, I was in France to teach. And toward the end of my stay, one evening I was in, in Paris on a sidewalk in front of the hotel waiting for a ride to take me to a Vipassana center where I was going to give a talk. And I suddenly realized this was my first time in, since I'd come to France that time that I didn't have an interpreter with me. I wondered what I would do if someone came up to me and asked me a question. And I'd be hobbled by my very, very bad French. And sure enough, there was a telephone line worker working on the street across from me. He saw me and he came over and said, marvelous, marvelous, you're just the person I want to see. He said, you're Buddhist, right? Yes. Does Buddhism teach you to be happy? Yes. How do you do that? And he went on to say that he had a miserable job, he had surrounded by dishonest people. How was he going to find happiness in his life? So I told him about practicing generosity, virtue of meditation. How do you meditate? Fortunately, we have a a website with some instructions in French, so I gave him the web, web address. He seemed very happy and shook my hand and went off. Well, the talk I was going to give that night at the Vipassana Center was on the same topic as we, the talk tonight, and how the present moment is not the goal. And so as we were giving the talk at the center, I told him about the incident and said, you know, if I had told the telephone, telephone line work just simply to accept the fact that his job was miserable and accept the fact that he had dishonest friends. He would have had the good sense to walk away. As the Buddha never said, that you just accept everything. We're in the present moment because we have a purpose for being here. So tonight I'd like to talk about what that purpose is. How the present moment is not the goal, but it is part of the path, an important part of the path. So we focus on the present moment, not with the purpose of Accepting it, we focus on to see what we're doing in the present moment is creating suffering. And what we can do is put a stop to that. And this requires understanding the Buddha's analysis of what's going on in the present moment, related to his teaching in karma. Now, there's a lot of misunderstanding around karma. Many people believe the Buddha taught karma simply because that was the dominant view in India at the time. <clears throat> but it actually was a very controversial topic. Whether there was rebirth, that was a controversial topic. Whether rebirth was related to karma, was also a con controversial topic. In fact, the Buddha said one of the distinctive parts of his teachings was that he was a karma lion, which means someone who's taught karma. It was not a universal trait of what was being taught in India at the time. And even with the other karma, gamma wadis at the time, his teaching was very different. And seeing where it's different gives some idea of what we're going to be doing with that moment. There was another group that was called the Megantas, which were the precursors of the Jains. They also taught karma, but they had a very different teaching. One was that the present moment is entirely shaped by the past. And that the most important karma that you're doing is your physical karma. In other words, what the body does. And they were different than them in both, in both cases here. He said, no, it was the present moment is not shaped by the past. And he asked them, what it's very rare for the Buddha actually to go out and confront other people about their teachings. But when they taught what he saw were pernicious doctrines about the power of action, he would go out on occasion and ask them about their teachings. So in this particular case, he went to them and said, how do you know that what you're experiencing right now is what you know in the past? And they said, well, we do all austerities and all this pain comes up. He said, well, have you noticed when you don't do your austerities, the pain doesn't come? And what you're doing right now is making a difference. We tend to think of the Buddha speaking peace, peace and light, but sometimes he could be quite, quite strong in his criticism. He was quite strong in his criticism of the Gunjas. And also, there are many discussions about the Gunjas about whether physical action is more important than mental action. The Buddha said it's because of the mental action that you, the, Buddha, the body moves up to begin with. So it's the mental action which is the most important. So precisely when you're focusing on the present moment, you're focusing on what you're doing in the present moment, in your mind. Because the mind is the factor that shapes your experience in the present moment. Basically what you've got here is the potentials for experience that are coming in from your past actions. But they don't provide the, the total story of what's going on in the present moment. You have to take those potentials and actu actualize them through the process of what the Buddha calls fabrication, sankara. And as you're doing that, that's when you have an actual experience, an 
eyes, the ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And so it's because of our lack of skill in the present moment that we're actually creating suffering. So the focus is on learning how to be more skillful in how we shape those potentials from the past into something that's actually a path to the end of suffering. So the Dharma is here is teaching us what to accept and what not to accept. We accept that past karma is providing us with the limitations on what's going to be available in the present moment. It's like having a vegetable garden. And depending on what you planted in the garden, you're going to have a range of vegetables that are going to be available for you to cook from. And sometimes there's not much there because you didn't plant many good vegetables. Other times there's plenty in the harvest. And it's up to your skill, however, what you're going to do with what you've got. Tana John? Yes. A few people are having trouble understanding. Um, I'm not sure what to suggest other than turning up one's own volume on one's own device. Yeah, I don't know if there's anything there that you can do. Yeah, I've got a microphone here. Let, let me try that. Is this clearer? Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Okay. What we're experiencing in the present moment is the result of potentials from the past and our skill or lack of skill in dealing with those potentials in the present. And so when we're meditating, we're trying to learn to be more skillful in what we're doing right now. So that like a cook, sometimes if you're a really good cook, you can take anything and make it into if you're a bad cook, sometimes you get the best ingredients coming in from the past, but you can still make yourself miserable. You can still make miserable food. So we're here to practice how we're shaping the moment as a moment. And the Buddha has a start art practice of meditation with what's called the practice of merit. It's the practice of generosity, virtue, and the development of goodwill. The Buddha taught generosity as a way of showing us how we can change our experience simply by change what we're, what we're experiencing simply by the act of generosity. The king once, once came to see the Buddha and asked him where a gift should be given. And he had asked many different groups and the different groups had, had said, well, give to us. And he was expecting the Buddha to say, basically, well, give to Buddhists. But instead, the Buddha said, give where you feel inspired. You feel, or you feel that it would be well used. In other words, the choice of where you're giving, the Buddha left entirely up to you it, 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 as an expression of your freedom of choice. Generosity here is primarily what you give, not because you have to, it's not because it's Christmas or because it's a birthday. Generosity here is when you feel out of the goodness of your heart that you just want to share. And the Buddha encourages that. This is one of the reasons why there are many rules for the monks so on making sure that we don't try to require people to give gifts to us. Or, Make, make lots of stipulations of what we would accept and not accept. We have to receive people's generosity as, as they feel inspired. Similar with the practice of virtue, you learn that as if you avoid unskillful behavior. Your life changes. You learn how to say, for example, avoid lying. It makes you on the one hand, you have to be more careful about your words. But as you're more careful about your words, how you say things, you begin to realize that people will listen to you more. And it shapes a different world around you. The purpose of this is to show you that the choices you're making in the present moment give their rewards not only on into the future, but also in the, in the present as well. But one of the lessons you learn as you're engaging in generosity, virtue, and the practice of meditation, is that these are things you have to keep up. You have to keep doing them all the time. You can't just be generous once and hope that it will take care of a lifetime of happiness. It's a constant process. It's a constant construction going on in the present moment. You can't simply rest on your laurels, which is why the present moment is not a place where you can rest. You can rest temporarily in concentration, 
but even concentration has to be put together. The concentration is always falling apart unless you keep look, looking after it. So these are the things we have to accept. That on the right hand, we do have some power in the present moment to shape the past. We have to accept what is coming in from the past, but we have also accept some responsibility for what we're doing. We also have to accept the fact that the present moment itself is a place of construction. It's a construction site. It can't be taken as a goal in and of itself. But to tell you just simply to stay here and accept what's coming in would, would be defeatist. Years back, I was listening, when I was practicing my French, getting ready to go to France, I was listening to a TV show. Over there, they have a, a weekly TV show where they interview Buddhist teachers. Can you imagine that in America? But they had one teacher on there who was talking about how the whole purpose of Dharma practice was to learn that you just don't mess with nature. Whatever comes up, you learn to accept it. And the interviewer, who was intended to be a very kindly person, challenged her and said, well, isn't that defeatist and pessimistic? And the, and the woman being interviewed said, only if you think about it. Well, the Buddhism was not the kind of person to tell you not to think. And also, he certainly wasn't defeated. He, he, he talked about the path as being a path of victory, where you win out over your defilements. And you look at the images the Buddha himself gives throughout the Pali Canon. You see this also in the images that are used by the forest Jhanas. There's never an image of some work, relaxing his or her way to awaken. It's the, the images of people who are searching, people who are trying to develop skills, people who are engaged in battles. In other words, they're facing difficulties and they're learning how to overcome them. So it's not a process of simply accepting. We see this especially in the Buddhist teachings as it moves on from the practice of merit under the Four Noble Truths. Each of the Four Noble Truths carries a duty. It's not simply a truth that sits there. It's a truth that tells you, this is how you should look at your experience, and this is what, once you look at your experience in these terms, this is how you act within, with each of these terms. In terms of the first noble truth, of course, is the truth of suffering. Clinging to the five thinking aggregates. And the duty there is to comprehend it. And comprehending means understanding it to the point where you develop this passion for it. The second truth, the origination of suffering, which is craving. That's something to be abandoned. The third noble truth, the cessation of suffering is to be realized. And you do that by following the duty of the fourth noble truth, which is to develop it. In other words, you take the potentials you have for the for concentration, for virtue, and for discernment, and you develop them and make them strong. And the, the, these duties are what provide the context for when the few times in the canon where the Buddha actually talks about being in the present moment. And it's always because there's work to be done there, duties to be followed. And it's also interesting that whenever the Buddha talks about being in the present moment, it's always in the, in the context of death contemplation. The, image being, the message being that there's work to be done in the present moment. If you don't do it now, when are you going to do it? You don't know how much time you've got left. I'll read your poem. You shouldn't chase after the past and place expectations on the future. What is past is left behind. The future is as yet unreal. Whatever quality is present, you clearly see right there, right there. Not taken in, unshaken. That's how you develop the heart. Ardently doing your duty today, because who knows, tomorrow, death. There is no bargaining with death in its money voice. So doing your duty, the Buddha Harris Cross is talking to the duties with regard to the Four Noble Truths. So there's work to be done. There's another passage where the Buddha is talking to a group of monks, telling them that they should practice mindfulness of breathing. And also at the same time to re reflect on death. And one monk says, well, I reflect on death every day. And he says, how often? He says, once a day. And then someone else says, well, I, I reflect on death twice a day. Someone else says, well, I do it. I do it. And they, it's shorter and shorter intervals. And they finally get to someone who says, while I'm breathing in, I reflect. As long as I have this in-breath, I'm going to get a lot out of the practice. As long as I have this out-breath, I'm devoted to the practice. It was okay. That last one, he's, he's the one who's heedful. Everybody else is heedless. 
So you take the fact that death could come at any time as a way of inciting you to practice right now. So we're not in the present moment simply to accept it. We're not in the present moment because it's a wonderful place to be. But because there's work to be done, we don't know how much time we have to do it. There was yet another passage where the Buddha said, every night when the sun goes down, remind yourself, this could be the last sunset you see. He said, death could come tonight. It could come very easily. Are you ready to go? And you ask yourself, is there anything in my mind that would make it difficult to drop my life as I have it right now and move on? If you find this, anything, whatever comes to mind is being a difficulty, you have to work on that right now. The same thing with when the sun rises in the morning. This could be your last sunrise. So, are you ready to go? If something would ever happen during the day. If not, work on your duties as they're laid out in the Four Noble Truths. Now, these duties that are laid out in the Four Noble Truths, if you look into the dependent core rising, the Buddha gets into more detail. Turns out that there are steps in the present moment that are prior to sensory contact. You look at the pentacle rising, and it's a pretty intimidating teaching. But one of the first things you should notice if you look at the list is contact of the senses does not come at the very beginning of the cause of practice or suffering. It comes halfway through. There's a lot that the mind is already doing before sensory contact, including the process of fabrication, the way we put things together. And so this is one of the reasons why when we meditate, we focus on these processes of fabrication. For example, when you focus on the breath, the breath itself is called bodily fabrication. There's an element of intention in the breath. And then there's directed thought and evaluation as you're thinking about the breath, evaluating whether the breath is a comfortable place to stay, an easy place to sit. If it's not what you can do to adjust it, what you can do to get the most sense of rapture or pleasure out of the breath, and then spread that through the body. All of that is verbal fabrication. You're talking to yourself in very simple terms about working with the breath. And then there are feelings and perceptions. Feelings are the feeling tones of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. The perceptions are the labels of the mind, the images you use, the very quick individual words that you use to identify something. These play a role in your concentration as well. If you think just breath, Breath, breath coming in. That's a perception. And you're trying to develop a feeling of ease and well being in the breath. So, as you're practicing meditation, you're getting hands on experience with these processes of fabrication that go on in the mind all the time. I know a lot of people say, gee, I've got to do some directed thought and evaluation if I'm going to get my mind in the first jhana. We're already doing directed thought and evaluation all the time as you go through the day, the extent to which you're talking to yourself, yourself as you go through the day. That's direct thought and evaluation. You're already breathing. You're already dealing with feelings and perceptions. It's something that you're learning how to put them together in a new way. You get more sensitive to these processes to see that you do have choice in the present moment. And as you exercise that power of choice, you can make a difference. And all this relates to the fact in the Buddha's picture of the mind. The mind is an active entity, you might say. It's not there simply passively receiving things coming in from the senses and then reacting. It's out there looking for things. Sometimes it's looking for trouble. Sometimes it's looking for peace. Sometimes it's looking for pleasure. It's looking for all kinds of things, but it's, it's basically the mind is hungry and it's always active in its hunger. And so that's going to color the way we experience things in the present moment. So as we meditate, the Buddha is basically getting it, trying to get us to become more sensitive to how we're doing this already. And as it turns out, this new karma of your fabrication in the present moment, if you look at the list of the factors in dependent core rising, the factor of intention, which comes under name and form, actually comes prior to contact with the senses. And Buddha said contact with the senses should be seen as your old karma coming at you. So it's your new karma is actually prior to your experience of old karma. And the new karma is there for the sake of something. This is what the process of fabrication means. It's, we're doing it for the sake of the pleasure that would come when you have certain feelings, have, have certain perceptions, certain thoughts. 
you move the body around in certain ways, that you're aware of things in certain ways. You have a purpose for this, which means that the present moment is not outside of time. It's very much inside of time. You're there actively putting it together for the purpose of a pleasure now and on in the future. So there are people you know, who pride themselves that they don't worry about the future, but that they're simply there in the present moment. They're missing out on what, what's actually happening in the mind. A lot of the stuff goes on the ground. This is why the Buddha doesn't tell you simply to follow your bliss. And what he did say, he warned you the dangers of them, staying content with the pleasures of a still mind. In other words, concentration on itself is not going to be enough. Even more so the dangers of Resting content with central pleasures. We hear so much about the dangers of concentration, although I'm sure that in your group you, you've learned that over, over how we fear of concentration. But you know, the Buddha himself never talked about co concentration as being dangerous. The big dangers are not having concentration as a, as a source of pleasure and a source of well being. Because then the mind goes back to its old central, central fantasies, central obsessions. Nobody ever killed anybody over jhana. Or we stole anything over John. It's because of our sensuality that there's killing and stealing and lying and all the other horrible things that people do to one another in the world. But still, even, even when you develop a sense of good, solid concentration in the present moment, it's still, again, it's constantly under construction. So you can't rest content there. So just as the mind is proactive, the Buddha teaches a proactive path to the end of suffering. In other words, we create a path in shaping the aggregates and shaping the different types of fabrication. We develop right resolve. We don't just sit there and learn about the Four Noble Truths. We realize that our actions have to be brought in line with the Four Noble Truths, and we have to resolve on that. Resolve is a, is a stronger word than intention and power in an overall policy of how you want to conduct your life. Mindfulness, too, is proactive. One of the factors of mindfulness is ardency. In other words, you're trying to, you're not simply aware of skillful and unskillful things arising. If something that's skillful is not there yet, you try to make it arise, and you try to prevent it from passing away. That's what the Buddha calls mindfulness as a governing principle. When you learn about fabrications by trying to do them skillfully. It's like the Army Corps of Engineers. They've learned an awful lot about the mouth of the Mississippi River. They're trying to keep it from changing. Apparently it changes every 10, 20,000 20, years. And our, our Mississippi River is well, well overdue for a change. But they've been trying to prevent it. And they've learned an awful lot about the currents of the river and, and the way the river behaves by trying to bring them into control. And it's the same way you learn about your mind by trying to bring them into control in the process of developing concentration. Even what we they tend to think of as some of the more passive qualities in the path have their role within this proactive context. For example, with equanimity. The Buddha never taught equanimity on its own. He always kind of taught it in conjunction with other qualities. For example, there's the, there's the equanimity in the context of the four Brahma Bharas or the four Sabhama bodies. And so you don't just develop equanimity, you develop it in conjunction with goodwill and compassion and empathetic thought. You might think of this as the equanimity of a doctor. The doctor wants his or her patients to get well. But there are the cases where the doctor knows, okay, this patient has some symptoms that I can't cure. But the doctor doesn't give up, doesn't get upset about those. He or she focuses instead on what, what can be done to help the patient. So you're not just accepting, well, the patient's going to get sick, this disease is beyond me. Just let it go. You do what you can to, at the very least, provide some comfort for the patient and to work on the symptoms that you can cure. But in the same way, there are things going on in your mind that you're not ready to deal with yet. So I have to be economist about those uh, so I can have the energy to focus on the areas where I can make a difference. That's the role of equanimity. You would have more when you're practicing, trying to practice concentration, or focusing too much on equanimity because you're Concentration begins to stagnate. Concentration 
has to be balanced with equanimity and with privacy. The Buddha gives an example of trying, being a goldsmith, trying to make some gold ornaments. And equanimity is just looking at the gold. And of course, the goldsmith does have to look at the gold, but he also has to put the gold into the fire. He also has to blow on it. Putting it into the fire, it stands for your effort. Blowing on it stands for your concentration. Looking at it stands for your equanimity. To engage in these things as appropriate, you don't just sit there and look, look, look at the gold, because you never get to make anything out of it. Similarly with patience, it's also it's in the context of the proactive nature of the path. And this will be the patience of a warrior. When you're in battle, you know, you know that there are going to be setbacks. You think times you have to wait. The enemy hasn't showed yet. He hasn't showed up yet. Or the enemy has showed up and has been victorious in the last battle. You have to be patient with that. You can't let yourself get upset. You have to have a sense of endurance. You have to be able to deal with the hardships that are coming up for the sake of eventual victory. If you don't have that kind of patience, then victory will never come. So as the Buddha teaches you to be patient with physical pains, patient with harsh words. Learn how to endure these things so they don't get you upset. And so they don't derail you from the ground. The same with contentment. When the Buddha teaches contentment, it's basically contentment with external conditions that are good enough to practice in. The food, clothing, shelter, medicine. Is it good enough to practice? If it is, okay, you've got enough. However, there, he's, the Buddha himself said that the secret to his awakening was that he did not let rest content with the level of skill in his heart. There are any areas where he needed more skill, where he realized that he was still suffering. He did not rest content. He was, he was discontent in those areas. It was because of that that he was able to get awakening. So you realize that even with equanimity, patience and contentment, you have to use your discernment as to when they're appropriate when they're not, within the context of this proactive path that the Buddha teaches. Discontent, in this case, drives you on the path. First motivating you to develop concentration and then motivating you to go even beyond the practice of concentration. It's interesting that the word jhana, the, the, the Buddha uses for right concentration, is related to the verb jayanti. And one of the meanings of jayanti is to burn. And we know about the burning of the fires of defilement, but the, the jayanti is a different kind of, it's a different verb. And it indicates a different kind of flame. It's a steady flame. It's a flame, it's the flame of an oil lamp. And you know, in the old days, when they read at night, they would read by an oil lamp. And when the mind has that kind of steady flame inside, it can read itself. However, it's still burning. And so the Buddha says the next step is to learn how to take apart your attachment even to the states of concentration. When you contemplate concentration in terms of the five, excuse me, in terms of the three perceptions of it, it's being in constant stressful in itself. When you develop dispassion for it. This is you find yourself here in the present moment with the concentration, but even dispassion for the present moment. That's when an experience of the deathless can come. There's no fabrication for the sake of anything at all, because even the best thing that you could have fabricated, you realize, is, still has its stress, still has its drawbacks. You want to look for something better. It's in looking for something better that the mind gets inclined to the deathless. Now, there is a pleasure that is experienced and there's a state of awareness that's experienced, which, is, which has nothing to do with the aggregates. It's this the first experience of awakening is called the opening of the Dhamma or the beginning of the Dhamma. And it's expressed in these terms whatever is subject to origination is all subject to cessation. Now, some people think that's simply a statement of seeing how things are impermanent. But when the Buddha uses the word origination, it doesn't mean simply things are arising away, it means things are working right, right because of the cause. And the cause is almost always internal, it's something in the mind that you're dealing with. But when you can get rid of these internal causes, that's when you know something that doesn't, is not subject to origination, and is not subject to passing away. And that's the experience of that bus. 
the Buddha calls this consciousness without surface. In other words, there's no object. Without, it's not conscious in the aggregates. It's outside of space and time. After that experience, you return to fabrication again, but it's a big difference. You've realized again, the Buddha was right. There is a deathless happiness, which is not in the present moment, but is accessed from the present moment. It's something that does stand outside of time. You've seen that. The only difference between that and full awakening is full awakening is you, the Buddha gives an analogy. The difference between looking at the water in a well and seeing that there is water in the well and actually plunging down into the well. After you gain total awakening, it's taught that your intentions are there, but they leave no seed for a further come. You experience the present moment dissociated from it. You also seem to just join from it. Not the sense of unhealthy psychological dissociation, but simply realizing that you're not trying to feed off of it anymore because you found something better. You're not trying to use the present moment to build any new homes. There's no more construction going on. Not all it may seem very far away, but it does have implications for the here and now. The first one is that you know what to do with the present moment. You're using it as a path, you're not using it as a goal. We enter the present moment not to stay there, not to resign ourselves to it, or to the momentary pleasures that can come in the present moment. We're not performing a self lobotomy and saying, okay, I'm just going to learn how to not have any more desires than but I can extend and experience the present moment. But it does encourage you to look, look for a true happiness, a happiness that does not, it's not one of lowering your standards, it's one of raising your standards. So we realize that as we're practicing here, we're learning what to accept, what not to accept. We accept the things coming in from past actions, but we don't accept our lack of skill in dealing with them. This is something we realize we have to work with. We can make them but the present moment a better place. This is what the practice of merit teaches us. All too often, all too often people really think of the practice of merit as something that's not related to the meditation. It's very intimately related to the meditation because it teaches you the power of the mind, the power of your actions to shape your experience. We can free ourselves from bad influences from the past and we can create, create good conditions for the future. And we're not stuck here. It's like the health alignment, as I've said, he doesn't have to be stuck. He didn't have to be stuck with his miserable job and his dishonest friends. With his practice, he could learn how to create a new environment around him. In the meantime, as we see that there is the present moment is on fire with passion, virtue, and illusion, we can learn how to dampen those flames as we practice concentration and ultimately find that find an escape to something that's totally free from flames is totally non-flammable. So we come to the present moment to see what we can make out of the present moment, realizing that the Buddha says there's actually much that can be done here. You do your best to shape it as best you can. Until you run up to something, you run up to the limitations of what's available in the present moment, and then you find the lies beyond. So those are my thoughts for the evening. I'm going to have to pull out the this microphone's up and doing it.